Welcome to the Midlife Career Rebel, the podcast created for high achieving professional women to gain the clarity, confidence and courage they need to go after and get the life and career they want. I'm your host, Dr. Carol Parker Walsh, lawyer, social scientist, brand strategist, executive coach, entrepreneur, and midlife career rebel. Each week, you'll learn strategies to manage your mind, navigate the challenges of midlife, and take control of your career so you can thrive doing the work you love. So if you're ready to tear up that rule book and create your own, you're in the right place. And I can't wait to show you how. Hey Rebels, welcome back to our four part series on the four levels of a careerist. Now today we're talking about the third level, which is the established level. And this level is usually the end result of the hustler level, which we've already talked about. And it's often the place where when women arrive here, start to really question, why are they here? Right. Once they're at or nearing the top of that ladder, which they so diligently climbed, they begin to panic a bit, wondering, is this all there is? And if it's possible for them to do something else. Now, if you've missed the episodes on level one, the drifter and level two, the hustler, please go back and check those out so you can see the subtle differences between these levels. And it's important because if you're wanting to do something different, you got to know where you're at so you know how to build the bridge to where you want to go. You want to know the nuances, the differences, the things to look out for, the things that may be holding you back, and the things that can help propel you forward. And these episodes are designed, particularly in this series, to help you get that information so that you could do just that. So let's get into it. Now, once you reach the established level, you've been grinding your way through, often on autopilot. So it's not uncommon to look around and wonder, how did I get here? Right? You've been hustling in your career for about 15 to 20 years now. You're making significant income. You're being invited to sit on boards, speak on company and industry panels, present at conferences on behalf of your organization, and you're being honored and awarded for all of your hard work and that expertise that you have so diligently built up all of these years. And to borrow a lyric from one of my favorite animated movies, The Prince of Egypt, you're playing with the big boys now. And to everyone around you, you've arrived, you've made it. So everyone is cheering you on applauding you seeing as you seeing you as a baller you are because of where you're situated in your career. But at this level, you're also deep within the midlife pivot. And I'm going to talk about what the pivot is. But Psychologist Eric Erickson developed the eight stages of psychosocial or human development, something which I studied pretty deeply in my doctoral program. And he maintained that throughout the lifespan, individuals go through a kind of psychosocial crisis, which could create a positive or a negative outcome during that developmental part of their life. So in the midlife pivot, We're in what's called the generativity or stagnation stage, right? That's the positive or the negative way we can go. We're at this particular stage of the lifespan. Now, generativity is about making our mark on the world, creating or implementing things that will outlast us and create a positive change in the world that others will be able to benefit from. So that's the positive side that we can go into. And it's what comes up for us when we're in that midlife pivot. Now, if we're in that place and we remain stagnant, however, we'll feel unproductive and even disconnected from not only our work, but the contributions that we're making to our community or to the world. So in the stagnation phase, we run the risk of feeling regret, which is a big deal in that particular stage. I often talk about regret and that we often don't regret the things that we've done, but the things that we haven't done. Right. When we look back over our lives and wonder about the opportunities that we ignored or the possibilities that we left on the table or the choices that we could have made. Right. That's the thing about regret is that we look back over what we didn't do, not the things that we did, where we start to wonder about what we could have created and what we could be leaving behind. So to put this in context, if you're in the established level in midlife, you may be feeling a crisis of consciousness, right? A calling to do something different, something more, to veer off that course that you've been following so diligently and looking to explore those roads that were less traveled. 
And while you're in the midlife pivot, your professional identity has become your most significant identity. So it's challenging to think about taking any different road because what you do has become almost who you are. You're literally also really in the middle of two generations. You're raising kids and maybe taking care of aging parents. And at this stage, that whisper that maybe you were hearing and possibly ignoring at the hustler level is now demanding your attention. And you're starting to think much deeper and more purposeful about where you are in your career, what you're doing and the contributions and impact that you wanna make. You're intuitively figuring out what no longer matters to you and are beginning to wonder what really does matter to you. Today, it's not so much about people pleasing and external validation as much as it used to be while you maybe were in the hustler phase. And it's more about whether or not what you're doing has meaning, value, and purpose to you, right? It's more about um, people, it's not so much about people telling you how good you have it or you thinking that you all figured it out, right? It's really about going after something that's really purposeful and important for you. But you're also stuck between this idea of, well, but I finally figured it all out. Like why change now? Why upset the apple cart? After all, you developed an expertise in your work or your industry. And now it would be ridiculous to start over or try something new. At least that's the limiting thought or belief that either you're too old or you're too established, right? Or it's crazy to quote unquote, start over. But the truth is all of that is a myth. It's just really bullshit. It's just fear talking, it's society talking. You know, once again, it's buying into societal ideas of what it means to age or be an older person in midlife and what's possible for us because the world tells us at midlife, it's time to wind down, it's time to sunset everything and to make room for things that are new, right? Instead of revving up and stepping out into something different, it's the exact opposite that we're fed in this world. But remember Erickson's stages, right? It's not true. At this stage, actually in life, you are more looking more at doing something different, new that allows you to make a contribution. You're looking at the impact that you can make. So it's this fight between what you're feeling and the fight between maybe the feedback that you're getting around you. And at this stage in life, you're never starting over because you have so many gifts and experiences that you're not starting anew, but merely pivoting into something different. Now, in her book, How Women Rise, authors Sally Helgeson and Marshall Goldsmith talk about the value of overvaluing expertise. And actually what they're saying is that it's not really a value, but it's what we value, right? We overvalue expertise. And when I first read it, I was like, huh? Like, what do you mean? Of course we're trying to be experts. But as I continued reading, I can see they weren't against gaining expertise, just against gaining it above all else. Because of the danger of overvaluing it is the danger of keeping you trapped right where you are right? It's like, it seems like a great strategy. And it is if you want to stay with the same company, stay in the same industry, stay in the same job. But it's not useful when you get to a place and you're thinking about what do I want to do next? Right? That's why in my program Fearless, we emphasize mastering and owning your natural gifts, talents and genius, not just your education and experience that usually forms the basis of your expertise. And when you're focused on just those things, it's like wearing blinders to any other potential opportunity out there or what you could potentially utilize and do and offer the world. Now, in the book, they say it's only natural that women would want to become experts at what they do, since it's how many women earn their spots at the table in the first place, especially if you're in a male-dominated career and you felt like you really had to prove yourself. And so you put enormous effort into learning every aspect of your job and assuring your work is picture perfect, which feels proactive and the right thing to do. And of course, that's what we're trained to do when we're hustling on autopilot, climbing that ladder, we're trying to become the best at what we do. But the way they frame it, which I think is fascinating, 
is that it just puts you on an endless treadmill of overworking and overcommitting to an employer or a position that's ultimately limiting you into terms of what's possible because you're only looking at that path, that ladder, that work, that expertise as all you could potentially do. So now when you reach the midlife pivot and you're thinking, I want to do something else, there's a dissonance that's caused between that initial thinking of climbing that ladder, honing that expertise, and the potential of doing something different. Meanwhile, men are doing their jobs good enough, right? They're showing up, but they're also spending their time building relationships, keeping that visibility up, exploring other options, which allow them to not only climb the ladder, but also explore different levels of things in their career. So while you may have been on autopilot, keeping your head down, going after those external rewards, you forgot to take the time necessary to figure out what you really want. Is that the path that you really want to take to foster your values, to foster your dreams, to take risks, to go after opportunities in your career that move, maybe moved you a little bit off the ladder and possibly onto new and exciting pastures? Whether it was fear, imposter syndrome, or a lack of confidence that had you so focused on proving yourself and showing that you deserve the seat at the table that you received. The problem is now that you're at the established level, you feel afraid and unprepared to make any other move, right? Because you can only do what you've been doing. And even though you feel compelled to do do so, All of that chatter in your mind is telling you, what else can I do? Is it possible to do something else? Remember all those limiting thoughts. I'm too old. I'm too established. What if I lose everything if I go after something different? Because after all, what else do I have to offer? Which is such a misnomer and is so untrue because you have so much you can offer, whether it's a slight pivot into what, where you are or what you're doing in your current field or a complete shift into something else. The truth is you will land on your feet doing amazing things if you give yourself permission and the belief to think it's possible and to not just settle for where you are now. And that really is the struggle at the established level. It's that where you, where I find most of my clients when they come to me is that they're good at what they do. They have the resume, their credentials and everything. They're at the top of their game and they want to make a move, but they're so hesitant and so skeptical and so fearful about it. Like it, it, it the, the, the fear of what could happen clouds their mind so much because they're so established in their field. And they'll talk to me and share chapter and verse of how they've won awards and how they've been doing this for 28 years and how, you know, they could basically do it in their sleep. But they also tell me the deep rooted desire to not do that anymore. But that that, that conundrum of, but I'm good at this and I've established myself at this and I want to do something else, but not feeling as if they can because they've never given themselves permission to even think about exploring something different along the way. Now they come to me and they're stuck at what I call the good enough zone. Because what's going on in their mind is, while I do want to make a move and do something different, I really have a pretty good. <laughs> I mean... Uh, you know, I'm doing pretty well. I'm making some good money. I'm calling the shots at my job. You know, I'm traveling. I have a great house. Like, you know, do I really need to make a difference? But that's such a dangerous place to be. Because that good enough zone keeps you trapped. Now, I've talked before about the motivational triad and how the brain is designed with these three guiding motivators to avoid pain, seek pleasure, and conserve conserve as, as much energy as you can, right? Putting forth the least amount of effort, which in other words, I call that the comfort zone, right? It keeps you right where you are conserving as using as um, the least amount of energy as possible. So in a sense, our principal motivation at the good enough zone is to stay put, is to stay where you are. And that's where people stay stuck because of the fear, right? Avoid pain, which is the fear of the unknown. And the pleasure is all that you're enjoying in the good enough zone. And you're, you're conserving energy and putting out the least amount of effort. So the brain is calling you to stay exactly where you are because after all, you're like, hey, I'm doing pretty good, right? <laughs> Everyone else is telling you, man, look at you. I wish I could be where you are. 
You're even maybe telling yourself, better the devil you know than the devil you don't. At least I know how to operate in this space, right? So it's easy to buy into the myth that the good enough zone feeds you. The problem is that the good enough zone never lasts. I mean, think about it. The good enough zone isn't pandemic proof. It doesn't often survive a divorce or empty nest syndrome or a bout of an illness or an accident like I experienced. Because if it did, then when those things happened, we wouldn't see the, particularly with the pandemic, we wouldn't have seen the mass upheaval in the workplace that we saw, right? And frankly, experiencing, we're experiencing it all right now in what's called the great breakup, that people are still unhappy and unmotivated. We wouldn't have these statistics that people were looking for other things that they want to do because they're looking for more fulfillment, more alignment, right? And more happiness in the work that they're doing. So the truth is good enough never lasts. At some point, you're going to hit a wall and good enough's not going to cut it anymore. And often it does take, it's interesting for women, it does take something significant to shake us out of it because we're very good at settling for good enough. We're very good at making sure that everyone else is excelling beyond belief while we're sitting back and settling. But at some point, it just doesn't last. So why wait when you can actually be proactive and do something about it? The problem with good enough is that it not only impacts you profoundly, right? Remember Erickson's stage about generativity and stagnation. It also affects your family because you suddenly find yourself unmotivated and uninspired by work, right? It's been that way for a while, but it feels like it just came on. Or the stress of feeling trapped and stuck in your well-defined expertise is stressing you out and impacting your physical and mental health. And what about your legacy? What about your desire to do more, to impact at a greater level? When you're settling for good enough, you're no longer in control of your life and career. Instead, your career is in control of you. You can't have the true freedom that you want and make the choices that are available to you or possible for you because you're trapped and settling and good enough. So what do you do? Well, the midlife pivot, particularly during the established level, is a very precarious dance. You're very conscious of the responsibilities in front of you, like your retirement, your mortgage, you know, tuition payments and things of that nature. And you're also very conscious of the secret daydreaming you've been doing about a life and career you could have on the other side of saying yes to yourself. But as I said, fear constantly reminds you of all you would lose, and it blinds you to seeing the path on the other side of saying yes. Fear also tells you that you can't change careers or do something else because you haven't built an expertise in it as you did in this career. So those pathways feel no longer available to you. But to break free from the good enough zone, you've got to reclaim your identity separate from your professional identity. You got to figure out who you are now, not who you were at 20 or 30, whenever you started your career, but who you are today and who it is you want to become. You have to reconnect with what makes you unique and incredibly valuable beyond the external accolades, acknowledgements, and rewards. You got to allow yourself to dream about what's possible and believe that those dreams are still available to you. You've got to restore the narrative of your life and career into one that fits not who you've been, but who you want to be. You also have got to release yourself from the ageist paradigms and societal pressures that's trying to get you to move out of the way and make room for the next generation, as if what you have to offer the world no longer matters. Julia Child wrote her first book at 50 after serving a career in the military. And it just started off as a hobby, and then she landed a TV show at 50. Stan Lee, who wrote many of the Marvel comics that we've enjoyed over these years, didn't sell his first one until he was 40, and he was in his 70s when the Marvel Universe finally hit the big screen. Vera Wang didn't enter the fashion industry until she was 40. And Toni Morrison won the Nobel Prize for Literature at 62. Listen, I want you to draw a line across a piece of paper and at one end, write zero, and at the other end, 
write 100. Now take your age and on that line, where write where it would fall, mark where it would fall between those two numbers. Now I want you to observe how much space there is between where you drew that mark, representing your age, and 100. And I want you to see that that's how much life you have to live. That's how much more time you have to make that contribution, to do that fulfilling work, and to leave that legacy that at the established level, you are dying to do. So are you going to settle now? Are you going to stop and just live with good enough? I sure hope not. And listen, if you're ready to move out of the good enough zone and see all that you have to offer at this stage in your life and beyond, then I would love for you to reach out to me and let's get on a call and talk about it. Right now, Fearless, the Crew Rebel Academy is closed, but I'll drop a link to the wait list in the show notes. But I am offering VIP accelerators where you can work with me over a two-day intensive to help you move out of that good enough zone. And I'll also drop a link to apply for one of those accelerators in the chat as well. I only do two a month, so you want to grab one and take advantage of it. Well, that's it for part three of our series. I hope hopefully this opened up your eyes to what it means to be at this level while you're in the pivot and what it means to be stuck in the messages that you're listening and believing that are keeping you there. Don't let fear stop you. Don't let this idea that you have everything you need and that is all good enough keep you from stepping up to that next level. Look at that line that you drew and how much more life you have to live and ask yourself, does it stop here? Join me next time for the final part of our four-part series where I'll talk all about what it means to be at the rubble level. So I'll see you next time. And until then, have an amazingly rebellious week. See you soon. That's it for this week's episode. Hey, and if you're loving what you're learning, be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe to this podcast so you never miss another episode. Also, don't forget to read the show notes and grab the free resources mentioned so you can start implementing what you're learning right away. Finally, are you ready to unlock your potential and fearlessly go after the career and life you want? Then join me and a community of other high achieving women in midlife, stepping into new levels of leadership, switching it up to do the meaningful and fulfilling work they're meant to do, and glowing up by creating the systems of freedom to achieve their dreams in Fearless, the Career Rebel Academy. You'll find the link in the show notes. Simply fill out the application and together we'll determine if this is the right fit for you. I can't wait to see you there.